there is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man, a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This highway leads to the shadowy tip of reality. You're on a through route to the land of the different, the bizarre, the unexplainable. Go as far as you like on this road. Its limits are only those of the mind itself. You're entering the wondrous dimension of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Every writer is a frustrated actor who recites his lines in the hidden auditorium of his skull. Being like everybody is the same as being nobody. There is nothing in the dark that isn't there when the lights are on. We're developing a new citizenry, one that will be very selective about cereals and automobiles, but won't be able to think. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. The worst aspect of our time is prejudice. In almost everything I've written, there is a threat of this. Man's seemingly palpable need to dislike someone other than himself. Fantasy is the impossible made probable. Science fiction is the improbable made possible. The tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallout. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all its own. For the children, and the children yet unborn, and the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the twilight zone. All the Dachau's must remain standing. The Dachau's, the Belsons, the Bechtenwalds, the Auschwitzes, all of them, they must remain standing because they are a monument to a moment in time when some men decided to turn the earth into a graveyard. Into it, they shoveled all their reason, their logic, their knowledge, but worst of all, their conscience. And the moment we forget this, the moment we cease to be haunted by its remembrance, then we become the grave diggers. For civilization to survive, the human race has to remain civilized. You see, no shock, no engulfment, no tearing asunder. What you feared would become like an explosion is like a whisper. What you thought was the end is the beginning. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. 
Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. It is difficult to produce a television documentary that is both incisive and probing when every 12 minutes one is interrupted by 12 dancing rabbits singing about toilet paper. If you need drugs to be a good writer, you are not a good writer. According to the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. It is man's prerogative and woman's to create their own particular and private hell. If you write, fix pipes, grade papers, lay bricks, or drive a taxi, do it with a sense of pride and do it the best you know how. Be cognizant and sympathetic to the guy alongside because he wants a place in the sun too. And always, always look past his color, his creed, his religion, and the shape of his ears. Look for the whole person. Judge him as a whole person. Some people possess talent Others are possessed by it. When that happens, a talent becomes a curse. The ultimate obscenity is not caring, not doing something about what you feel, not feeling, just drawing back and drawing in, becoming narcissistic. A sickness known as hate, not a virus, not a microbe, not a germ, but a sickness nonetheless, highly contagious, deadly in its effects. Don't look for it in the twilight zone. Look for it in a mirror. Look for it before the light goes out altogether. In any quest for magic, in any search for sorcery, witchery, first check the human spirit. The writer's role is to menace the public's conscience. He must have a position, a point of view. He must see the arts as a vehicle of social criticism, and he must focus on the issues of his time. It has forever been thus. So long as men write what they think, then all of the other freedoms, all of them, may remain intact. And it is then that writing becomes a weapon of truth, an article of faith, an act of courage. Every man is put on earth and condemned to die. Time and method of execution, unknown. It's simply a national acknowledgement that in any kind of priority, the needs of the human beings come first. Poverty is here and now. Hunger is here and now. Racial tension is here and now. Pollution is here and now. These are the things that scream for a response. And if we don't listen to that scream, if we don't respond to it, we may well wind up sitting amongst our own rubble, looking for the truck that hit us or the bomb that pulverized us. Get the license number of whatever it was that destroyed the dream. And I think we will find that the vehicle was registered in our own name.
I was deeply interested in conveying what is a deeply felt conviction of my own. This is simply to suggest that human beings must involve themselves in the anguish of other human beings. This, I submit to you, is not a political thesis at all. It is simply an expression of what I would hope might be ultimately a simple humanity for humanity's sake. I have no idea what your generation will be like. In mine, we were to enjoy peace in our time. A very well-meaning gentleman shouted those very words less than a year before the whole world went to war. But this gentleman was suffering from the worldly disease of insufferable optimism. He and his fellow humans kept polishing the rose-colored glasses when actually they should have taken them off. They were sacrificing reason and reality for a brief and temporal peace of mind. Whenever you write, whatever you write, never make the mistake of assuming the audience is any less intelligent than you are. As long as they talk about you, you're not really dead. As long as they speak your name, you continue. A legend doesn't die just because a man dies. Successful in most things, but not in the one effort that all men try at some time in their lives, trying to go home again. And also, like all men, perhaps there'll be an occasion, maybe a summer night sometime, when he'll look up from what he's doing and listen to the distant music and hear the voices and the laughter of the people and places of his past. And perhaps across his mind, they'll flit a little errant wish that a man might not have to become old, never outgrow the parks and merry-go-rounds of his youth. And he'll smile then, too, because he'll know it just as an errant wish, some wisp of a memory, not too important, really, some laughing ghosts that cross a man's mind. You see, we can feed the stomach with concentrates. We can supply the microfilm for reading, recreation, even movies of a sort. We can pump oxygen in and waste material out. But there's one thing we can't simulate. That's a very basic need. A man's hunger for companionship. The barrier of loneliness. That's the one thing we haven't licked yet. A place, a time, where a man can live his life full measure. I only wanted to tell you that this was the wonderful time for you. Don't let any of it go by without enjoying it. There won't be any more merry-go-rounds, no more cotton candy, no more band concerts. I only wanted to tell you that this is the wonderful time. Now, here. That's all. And something inside the young man cracked. The small compartment in the back of his mind where man closets his fears, ties them up, controls and commands them, broke open and they surged across brain and nerves and muscles. A nightmare flood, an open rebellion. A small footnote found in the court records of some parallel world. Trying to be the best at anything carries its own special risks, in or out of the twilight zone.